Our next talk is, uh, <coughs> is Gary Williams. He's going to speak about existing data and the use of models to document and predict golden eagles. Uh, Gary Williams is a Cheyenne-based wildlife biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's a member of the service's Western Golden Eagle team. He works primarily on landscape scale projects that address conservation needs of golden eagles throughout the Western U.S. We welcome Gary Williams, please. All right, well, thanks everybody for having me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak about some of the work we're doing, and uh, thank Campbell County for uh, putting this all together. So, um, again, my name is Gary Williams. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service out of Cheyenne, and what I'm going to talk to you today kind of builds on some of the concepts that Gary was mentioning in his earlier presentation is basically how to take <coughs> existing data or existing pieces of information and put that together to make meaningful products that you can use for conservation. And so what I'm gonna focus on are some of the models we've been developing and some of the conservation strategies that we build on top of that. And just to give you a little bit of a roadmap of the ground I'm gonna cover today, I'm first going to spend just a very brief minute talking about the regulatory context of the work we're doing. Secondly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the Western Golden Eagle team fits in with eagle conservation. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about some of our uh, habitat models that we've developed. Next, I'm going to uh, give an example of using those habitat models to do some risk assessment for golden eagles. And then finally, I'm going to talk about our conservation strategies that we're putting together by building all, these, all this information together. So, uh, the, you know, golden eagles are a little bit of a special case for raptors in this area, as many of you know, because not only are they protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, they also fall under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and the eagle rule that comes from that. And um, the way uh, the work we're doing fits in with this is that there is Eagle Conservation Plan guidance. And within that guidance, um, you know, which is currently for wind development, but also can apply to other forms of development, there are stages. And the work we're doing, um, we're producing these science-based products that fit in with stage one, which is the, the siting stage of the Eagle Conservation Plan guidance and then come back in in stage four, which is the strategic compensatory mitigation uh, stage of things. So the Western Golden Eagle team was established uh, about four years ago, and um, we cover an area roughly from uh, Texas to the Dakotas westward in the continental United States, and we were put together by Fish and Wildlife Service managers in the West that realized, you know, there's lots of energy development in the West, and we're likely to get a lot more, particularly with uh, the renewable energy side of things. And, and the idea behind this team is, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service does a lot of project level work, like Trish was describing earlier, but um, we wanted an opportunity to kind of stand back and take a bigger picture look at Golden Eagle conservation across the West. And, you know, of course, Golden Eagle populations are interconnected, they move long distances, they migrate, and so this is, you know, again, just an opportunity to kind of pull back and put things together at a larger scale. And so with that in mind, uh, we had two primary goals for the team. And the first is to come up with landscape scale conservation strategies for important areas for golden eagles in the West. And secondly, um, we're trying to come up with some tools that practitioners, you know, whether they be agency folks, industry folks, whomever, that they can use to plan for projects and, and kind of estimate impacts before things get going. And so the approach we took to try to address this is to basically four things. First of all, we're coming up with predictive models of golden eagle distribution and we're trying to do this for all uh, life history stages of golden eagles and throughout the year so that we're not just focusing on nesting information, although that's maybe the most important piece we're looking at, but we're also looking at movement and migration information and uh, where the eagles are uh, hanging out in the winter time as well. A second factor we're looking at are risks to golden eagles. Uh, one of the big ones uh, that we work on is electrocution because that's one of the primary sources of human-caused golden eagle mortality. Uh, we actually have a partner in the room, uh, Tracy Jones from Precor, 
who's been working on us, working with us on that aspect of things. But there are also other risk factors, you know, of course, energy development, contaminants, collisions with vehicles, et cetera. But what I'm gonna focus on today is the electrocution side of things as an example of that. Uh, thirdly, we work on information resources to support the management of golden eagles and some of their primary prey items. And again, um, and number four is just putting these pieces together, coming up with uh, re eco-regional conservation strategies. So developing strategies for uh, protecting and maintaining golden eagle populations that are specific to uh, areas within the Western United States. Oops. And so now moving on to our predictive models, again, we have three primary classes of models that we're working on. Models of breeding habitat, models of movement and migration, and also models of wintering areas. And our goal with these models, you know, as Gary had mentioned, you know, you can build models for lots of different purposes. We're not really trying to define ecological niche for golden eagles with these models. We're more interested in getting reliable spatial prediction of where you're likely to encounter golden eagles, where you're not likely to encounter them, and kind of the relative abundance in between different locations on the landscape. And just, just one other thing, you know, as I said, you know, these models are kind of a planning tool. Um, they're definitely not a substitute for project level monitoring. You know, they're, uh, they can kind of give you a picture of, you know, this is maybe a better spot to work from the uh, standpoint of uh, golden eagles than uh, other places, but you still are gonna need that project level monitoring. So uh, now uh, just moving on to some descriptions of some of the individual models. We have breeding habitat models where we're taking information like this, a golden eagle nest site and trying to relate that to aspects of the landscape so we can predict where we might find more nests. And the backbone of an effort like this, of course, is a nesting database. And we actually took a couple years to put together a database of nesting records for golden eagles across the West. And we're still slowly getting some, some more nest information trickling in, but we've done the lion's share of the work already. And so this is a database. It's uh, not the result of a systematic sample. This is a database that is from a variety of sources. I think we have about uh, 150 different cooperators who've contributed uh, close to 110,000 nest records right now, although some of these are duplicates. But I mean, you can see some general patterns here. And you know, one thing that just pops out at you is that Wyoming is an extremely important place for golden eagle nesting in the Western US. But, um, a couple drawbacks of this type of approach, and it's just kind of the nature of the beast, is again, as I said before, these nests are not the result of a systematic survey. So, I don't know if you can see this. So I can point to some of these black X's on the map, and we can say there either used to be a golden eagle nesting here, or there is currently a golden eagle nesting here. But one, what you can't do with a database like this is I can't point to a blank space on the map and say there are no golden eagle nests here because it's just the nature of the information that we have. So uh, fortunately, there are some uh, modeling techniques where you can use this type of presence-only information to get a handle on uh, nesting habitat. And there's a statistical package called Maxent where you can compare what are considered you know, important environmental variables for golden eagles in the landscape to random points that are selected um, uh, within that same region where no golden eagle nest is known to occur. And so these include um, aspects of uh, terrain, land cover, uh, human um, features in the landscape. Uh, we also look at primary productivity as kind of a surrogate for prey in the landscape. And so anyway, the idea is to put all these together and to come up with a model that predicts not only uh, where you're likely to see nesting, but also like the relative levels of nesting throughout an area. Uh, we tend to uh, build these models on an eco-region to eco-region basis. And here's a look at some of the models we have uh, either completed or drafted right now. Uh, in um, Wyoming, we have a completed model for the Wyoming Basin. We have a nearly complete model for the Northwest Great Plains, and we have a recently drafted model for the High Plains. So lots of products that are gonna be coming online for Wyoming here. And uh, just a, a couple things to point out about these. Uh, if you look at the heat maps here, just in general, uh, the uh, redder colors are areas where we're predicting 
higher relative uh, nesting density in the landscape. The bluer co colors are uh, lower densities of nesting, but the color ramp is specific to the ecoregion in which it was created. So for example, you know, if I'm looking at reds here in the Wyoming Basin, they may represent a higher uh, relative density of nesting than the dark red, say, here in the Northwest Great Plains, or vice versa. So it's uh, not an apples to apples comparison. You have to look within the region where the model was created. Uh, and a second thing to point out, and this is just kind of a limitation of this type of modeling, is you can say something like, you know, we expect to find X percent more nests here in this particular area than in this one, but something you can't say is you can't just point to a spot in the map and say, you're gonna find a nest here. So that's just kind of a limit of the approach. So now moving on to our uh, next class of models. These are uh, the winter landscape model, and this is a model we've developed that covers Golden Eagle use of the West from the months October through March. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Eagle data are a little bit harder to come by in the, for winter use, um, and so the approach we took with partner uh, Point Blue, who was our model developer, is we used multiple sources of data to put this model together. Um, one of the big sources was the Midwinter Bald Eagle Survey that's conducted by USGS. This um, particular survey also collects information for Golden Eagles, so we have that. Um, we have information from the eBird database, which has been appropriately filtered. And we also have a couple more localized data sources that were used to build the model. And so the way it came together is we laid out a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid that covers all of the West we filled in the information for cells where there was survey information available. From that, we built an occupancy model, and then that occupancy model was later refined using landscape scale variables that improved its predictive capabilities. And so here's a look at the existing winter model. It has been completed and it's actually getting ready for publication. But um, looking at the color ramp there, areas that are in browns are areas of predicted relatively lower use, areas in blues are higher use. And again, you know, Wyoming, and particularly Northeast Wyoming, probably not a surprise to a lot of the people in this room, is an area of high predicted use for golden eagles. Um, a third class of habitat models we have are models of movement and migration. And this is a project that is less mature than the other two still a work in progress, but the idea behind this is to use information from Golden Eagle's satellite transmitters to start documenting some of the primary movement areas where they move, where they settle, um, and um, look at patterns in that. And so it's a two-step project. The first step is just to take this information and you know, describe where we're finding the eagles, you know, uh, what the patterns of movement are. But then the second step is to take this information and uh, and put it together with uh, habitat variables and, and start looking at uh, what type of features of habitat in the landscape are associated with some of these different classes of movement and migration. And the idea being, you know, we don't have information for golden, move, golden eagle movement everywhere in the West, but if we had a model like this, you know, we could predict if an area was more or less likely to be a movement corridor than, say, another. Um, this looks like a big bowl of spaghetti here, but this is just a graphical representation of um, all the individual eagles that we have in this database. There's, uh, we were able to get almost 30 different cooperators to provide their information to us. Uh, roughly 800 individual eagles that we have tracks for, and that, um, once you aggregate it, is almost 5 million individual point locations of golden eagles in the west, and, and in this case in the east. This is one project that we're doing continent-wide. And so uh, in terms of where we are with the uh, different steps for the projects, we have a patterns of movement manuscript that is in press that should come out in the Journal of Raptor Research later this year. And the movement habitat relationship portion of the uh, work is something that's just a work in progress. We're expecting to have some of the preliminary products of those analyses late this year, but it's an ongoing process. And again, with 5 million data points, it's a very complicated modeling project for people that are much, much smarter than me. So that's where we are with that. And so now what I want to do after, since I've just kind of described our habitat models that we have available, what I'd like to do is talk about how we can use these in conservation planning. And what I'm going to do is uh, use an example with electrocution to illustrate some of the things we're trying to do. 
So this is what you see here is a model we've developed with a uh, company EDM Incorporated, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, they specialize in avian electrocution issues and they were able to work with us to develop a model of electrocution hazard for the states of Wyoming and Colorado. And the idea behind these models, they use the density of distribution power poles as a surrogate for hazard, electrocution hazard in the landscape. The logic behind that is that as you tend to get higher and higher densities of power poles, you tend to get more of the types of equipment that are associated with electrocution, transformers, things like that. And you also tend to get more of the line geometry that is, is associated with electrocution, such as right angles and dead ends. So um, at any rate, if you look at these maps, the areas that are darker browns are areas where you have higher uh, distribution power pole density, lighter colors, lower density. And one thing to point out before we uh, you know, move into this risk assessment example is, you know, you may have one of these brown blobs, like, and this is you know, probably not a great example, but we have a brown blob here. You know, that represents the hazard side of things. So there is probably quite a bit of dangerous electric equipment there. But if that doesn't fall within Golden Eagle habitat, it's not really a risk to them. And so keep that in mind as we're looking at this next slide. So um, what we did is we tried to come up with a prioritization process where we took a couple of our models, the winter model and the breeding model, and put them together with this pole density model to uh, come up with a scheme of areas where we thought electrocutions were more likely to occur. And again, we were able to partner with Precor, and they provided us the location of Golden Eagle electrocutions over the course of about 15 years or so. And so what we did is, we tried to see how the actual locations of electrocutions lined up with uh, where we predicted higher rates of electrocutions would occur. And so just to walk you through, is this map showing up okay? I can't tell in this light if it's, so you guys can see. So um, areas in blue, so uh, like here, here, areas in blue are areas that represent relatively high habitat value but low power pole density. Areas in red, represent area regions where you have higher power pole density but lower quality habitat and then areas in purple which are these kind of darker it doesn't really look like purple to me from here but uh, are areas where you have this overlap of high quality habitat with high power pole density and then the green crosses are area or the actual coordinates of uh, locations of electrocutions and you know just by eyeballing this map you can see that you know, quite a few of these electrocutions are occurring in those spots where you get that overlap between high quality habitat and high power pole density. And um, we actually did the math, and if you look at the average across the service area of Precor and compare that to the electrocution rate we're seeing in that overlap of high quality habitat and high pole density, it's about two and a half times better chance of getting an electrocution there than it is on average across the landscape. And so, you know, if you're an electric utility who has a limited budget for retrofitting, having tools like this where you can kind of narrow down where you're going to get the most bang for your buck are very, very useful, you know, not only for, you know, your pocketbook and complying with the wall, but, you know, just very important for Golden Eagle conservation because last time I looked, there were something like 115 million distribution power poles uh, in the U.S. and, you know, a large portion of those fall in Golden Eagle habitat and, you know, a very large proportion of the ones in Golden Eagle habitat have not been retrofitted or built to safe standards. So any way we can take information to prioritize which ones to retrofit first, you know, it makes a lot of sense for conservation. All right, so now I'm going to kind of shift gears and move from our risk example to talking about how we or putting things together for uh, Golden Eagle conservation strategies. And so what we're doing is we're taking these ecoregion specific habitat models, we're taking our uh, models of hazard and doing risk assessments, and we're taking information resources, which I was not able to pull into this talk, but uh, just Golden Eagle management aids. And we're putting them all together into what we're calling conservation assessments and strategies. And, one of the great things about these uh, conservation strategies is, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service is not building these in a vacuum. You know, 
I'll put a laser pointer on him right back there. Uh, Zach Wallace from WIND, uh, the University of Wyoming is a lead on one of these uh, conservation strategies. And what we're trying to do is to incorporate, you know, regional experts in the field, and you know, Zach would certainly qualify for that to take the lead in developing these plans and putting them together. And the idea is that we're going to be pulling in as many folks as we can who have uh, interest in uh, either Golden Eagle conservation or in developing in areas where uh, Golden Eagle conservation needs to take place, getting everybody to buy into these plans and uh, help us build them and review them. And so very, very collaborative uh, plans. And in terms of where we are with these uh, in Wyoming, Again, Zach is the lead on the Wyoming Basin Plan, and we're thinking we're gonna have at least a draft of that sometime late this year. Um, we, and we also have plans under development for the Northwestern Glade Plains, you know, where we are here today, and for the High Plains. And when these plans are completed, um, they're gonna be available in a couple of different places. One is the ECOS IPAC website of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and then we're also, this is not live yet, but we're gonna have a Western Golden Eagle Team website uh, where you can go in there, download whatever you want, find the information you need. And so just a, a little bit of detail about these assessments and strategies. Uh, there are four primary components. One is an introduce, introduction to the ecoregion because again, these are built ecoregion by ecoregion. These include factors that are uh, you know, important or considered to be important to golden eagles within that ecoregion. Secondly, we have Golden Eagle population summaries. These are the results of these models, literature reviews, and other sources of information. Thirdly, we have a population ecology section, which looks at Golden Eagle status and trends in each ecoregion and some of the limiting factors on their population. And then finally, we have a conservation strategy section where it's gonna be kind of an area of prioritization. So we're gonna have areas identified that are critically important for conservation. We have areas identified where you know there are golden eagle populations that are need in need of some type of management intervention, and then we'll have other areas identified, at least from the standpoint of golden eagles, where you know development might be less risky. So all those will be going in there, and again, risk assessments for uh, the important local risk factors for golden eagles in that eco region, and some conservation measures that can be taken to help improve the state the uh, Golden Eagle population. And uh, this is just a, a quick map, and I don't think this is showing up super well, the names of folks, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, so the Wyoming Basin, this is Zach Wallace from WIND is the lead on that. The Northwestern Great Plains, uh, we have Brian Bedrosian uh, from the Teton Raptor Center in Jackson is taking the lead on that one. And the High Plains area, Jeff Bedrosian from the Fish and Wildlife Service is the lead on that. And um, one plug I wanted to put in is um, there has been a recently formed uh, Wyoming Golden Eagle Working Group, and we're viewing this as one of the great places to be kind of a clearinghouse for the review of uh, the information in these plans. And, and again, I keep mentioning Zach's name, but he's one of the coordinators of this group now. And so. Uh, if anyone is interested in joining this group and uh, in getting access to this information for you know, for your review and for your use, Zach will be a great guy to corner and um, you know give them your contact information because this is a group we just formed in November. We have about I think 25 folks that are currently members, but we're we're actively looking for you know additional folks with interest in. Uh, Golden Eagle conservation and folks that work in development in areas that contain Golden Eagles to participate in that group. Oops, oh, there's the names. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so just, just kind of in summary, you know, we, we believe that the models of habitat and distribution that I've uh, been describing can help identify areas of potential conflict between Golden Eagles and development and help with planning. Um, we, uh, also think that um, overlaying these models of habitat and distribution with models of hazard can be a really effective way of planning out your conservation dollars and uh, spending your money most wisely. And so with that, you know, it, uh, we say, I don't know if we say it takes a village to come up with these plans, but we have a ton of cooperators uh, that have been helpful in, uh, you know, producing this information and pro providing data to us so we could build these uh, types of products and uh, including a number of folks from 
Wyoming who are highlighted in yellow. So um, with that, that's all I have, and I'll be happy to try and answer any questions folks have. Uh, Andrea Arabona, Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Gary, I'm wondering, this is um, fabulous stuff and I think it's very applicable to you know what we're discussing on um, these two days. Any thoughts about, it might be preliminary, but about the potential of using the golden eagle as, a, as a, uh, an umbrella species for other raptors through these plans and the, and the modeling that you're doing? I mean, that, that's certainly possible. And, and I think one of the things we're doing is maybe, I mean, this, this is a very involved and time consuming process, but this could be potentially a template for some other priority species in the state. You know, you know ferruginous hawks is where, you know, one that kind of jumps to mind, but you know, if we come up with this process and everyone is fairly happy with it, you know, I, I think that's one way that um, it could be helpful. And uh, umbrella species, we haven't really looked at yet, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, one thing we are doing um, with um, our, some of our habitat information for golden eagles is we're examining uh, Jason Carlisle from the University of Wyoming, and, and he also uh, does contract work with West, is looking at uh, how the uh, sage grouse protection areas overlap with what we're identifying as important golden eagle habitat. And so one thing that can do is, you know, if, if, if these areas are gonna be um, fairly well protected through the existing um, stuff that's being done for sage grouse, then maybe we could focus some of our golden eagle conservation efforts in areas that are less protected. Any other questions? I'm, uh, Matt Smith with uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, the, um, the models that you guys are talking about, the predictive models for nesting, and, um, and I assume that would be the main one. Are those the models that go into the local area um, population analysis for um, nest take? They or? are not, and that's, that's actually kind of a, I think a question that's gonna come up in the future because they're, you could, you could potentially use these nesting models to estimate local area populations <laughs> if, if you have a good solid model that is, you know, has pretty good predictive capability, but as of now, they're, they're not built into that, but that may be something that happens in the future. So the, the current information is based on just observed uh, nests for yes. LAP analysis? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Gary Bovet with the University of Wyoming. You, you may have mentioned this, and I might have, I might have missed it, but in the um, movement modeling that, yeah. that you're doing, are you going to pursue that based on um, you, using the, the movement characteristics of individual birds and trying to, to model that, um, or, or is that going to be more along the same lines as the, the breeding and the wintering where you use landscape characteristics to try to predict positions yeah, um, during a movement path? And, and uh, my honest answer is I don't know, Gary. Th th this is one of our uh, Western Golden Eagle team projects that I've been maybe a little less involved with, and I'm, I'm just not sure the answer to that question. It's, it's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Modeling movement is not a, is not a, as right. easy as modeling yeah. the static position. Yeah, but um, I, I can actually, I mean, if you're interested in pursuing, I, I can put you in touch with our lead modeler on that project, Jesse Brown, who's at the University of Nevada, Reno. All right, thanks. <laughs>